My name's Ken Smith. Uh, I'm the Dean of uh, ANZOG, and I'd like to welcome you all here to a typically uh, COVID launch, book launch, uh, which we're um, conducting uh, via Zoom. Uh, could I start by uh, acknowledging the traditional custodians of the, the land uh, here in Melbourne, uh, that is the Wurundjeri people of the uh, Kulin Nation. And uh, um, really uh, to acknowledge and respect their elders past, present and emerging. And to um, other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are with us uh, uh, today in in this important uh, book launch of, of Nick's book, as well as uh, um, kia ora to any uh, of our colleagues from Aotearoa, uh, New Zealand, who we work with on a regular basis. Um, thank you for your time today. And we're going to try and make this as, uh, uh, as uh, involved as possible. Um, uh, and uh, thank you, Felicity. You're going to be facilitating uh, both the panel, but more importantly, the engagement um, generally uh, with people who are involved in the launch today. Um, before I uh, make a few comments, Nick, about um, uh, your book, uh, obviously everyone's um, very committed given that the Tokyo Olympics are on. Um, I remember uh, uh, a number of years ago, uh, one uh, Norman May, who was then alive at the pool, um, yelling or screaming, gold, gold, gold. And uh, one could describe today as a bit of a gold rush, um, given that we're now fifth on the, uh, uh, the uh, tally, uh, the medal tally, although it's not a competition, <laughs> it is, but uh, <laughs> we try not to use that uh, uh, too much. But... I thought it was magnificent to see um, some of our particularly young swimmers. Um, you would have seen the, the um, obviously, Titmus with the, the two gold medals, uh, the awesome foursome uh, of both um, the, the women and men's uh, Coxless Four. But I thought um, Kaylee McKeon really took the cake. Um, uh, a family from Kabulcha, um, obviously, uh, the, the sister who was also a silver medalist in a previous uh, um, uh, Olympics um, spoke as a true Australian when um, she said um, you, you could uh, uh, take Kaylee out of Caboolture, <laughs> but you could never... Um, <laughs> you, sorry, yes, uh, however the expression goes, you all know. But um, when she dropped... Uh, in excitement, the F-bomb, uh, which any of us could do, but we won't do here at the book launch today. Nick and uh, her family said, we're proud Bogans. Uh, it made you feel proud about uh, obviously being Australians. Um, I was really proud for Nick. And, and Nick, I remember you provided the manuscript late last year. We were still obviously uh, subject to, to lockdown. And um, I went back to my initial communication with you, and I think it hopefully is still apt. Nick has um, worked with Anzog uh, for many years now, and uh, his program uh, across um, eight modules of both uh, the importance of problem solving, the importance of systems thinking, mm -hmm. and onto issues around uh, consultation and uh, um, implementation are really quite um, important for all of us. I particularly liked the very practical focus and the range of tools that are provided uh, within the, the book. Nick, um, yeah. and to master not only problem definition, uh, but problem solving, uh, and to move beyond what we uh, often uh, uh, do. We have, can have good policy, but we all know that, that um, it's, you know, 1% uh, 
uh, inspiration and 99% mm -hmm. perspiration. So, you know, the importance of implementation and where we often go wrong in the, the Federation is not so much in our policy approaches, but in how we implement those in a consistent mm -hmm. and coherent manner. I think the crucial part of the process that you've described is getting over preconceived ideas and attitudes that really we all have and our tendency to reach for quick fixes. Um, the, the system we operate in increasingly, as we all know, the 24-7 cycle, we know the social media cycle, we know the temptations of our political masters to sometimes reach for that quick fix before appropriate consultation is undertaken. That, you know, in earlier parts of my uh, long career, and Helen, you could attest to this as well, when there would have been quite detailed consultation with major stakeholders before an announcement on Facebook or on social media. Um, we, it's not sort of um, really pining for the past. It, 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 it is really saying as part of the process, consultative processes are really important. And rather than getting something out there for the sake of getting something out there, often it's far better far more productive to actually get things right. And to get things right, we need to engage with major stakeholders. So Nick, I'd, I'd really like to thank you because I think the, the case studies and various tools in the book will be particularly important for practitioners. So you summarise so many tools in that second part of the, the, the book that um, really um, provide some wonderful opportunities for us all to um, dip into uh, areas of solutions uh, and methodologies that we normally wouldn't have time to, uh, uh, to access each of those. So thank you. And okay. uh, it's a pleasure for Anzog to work with you on, um, on launching the book. And I'll hand over to you, Felicity. Thank you so much, Ken. And I think we can say the book is officially launched, which is very, very exciting. Uh, here it is on the shelf, ready to go. Uh, well, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. I'm sure there's lots of different places that you could be or ways you could be spending your time. Maybe you're in lockdown and this is the best show in town. So we'd love to start by asking you, why are you here tonight? Why did you come along to this session? So pop your answer in the chat. Tonight is going to be interactive, practical and thought provoking. So feel free to provoke our thoughts with why you are here at this session tonight. Maybe you'd also like to share something that you would like to get out of tonight. Nick is a rock star. John, I agree. That's why I'm here tonight. Fantastic. Spectrum, love the Tyler session, great. Supporting colleagues, excellent <laughs> topic, I agree. The name of the session is intriguing. We're gonna get into that a bit later. Some great comments coming through the chat. It will cover a whole range of these tonight. This is fantastic. We've got people wanting to learn how to better consult stakeholders in a way that influences them. I love that, it's brilliant. Ooh, we've got Wicked Problems already featuring early on in the discussion. Fantastic. Couldn't resist the great title of the session. Nick, I think you have to use this title in more sessions. <laughs> right? it's, uh, leveraging the title of the book. It's fantastic to see so many comments coming through. So feel free to comment and ask questions as we're getting the discussion underway. We'll have some time at the end for questions and answers and uh, really looking forward to hearing your insightful questions. So Nick, writing a book is a significant undertaking. I've tried for the last two years to do that myself and have failed miserably. So hopefully I can learn some lessons from you. This book is a really, really important topic, as we can already see from the comments coming through from people tonight. So why this book? Why the topic of solving the right problem? Why is it such an important thing to address, particularly right now? Yeah, look, thanks, Felicity. Um, look, I just sort of think, you know, as leaders in business and government, we face these problems that we can't allow to persist. And, and, and all of us do. And yet, so often... The problems that we face do persist, 
and they escalate risk and they impose a huge financial and societal cost on all of us. And, and look, chief among them is climate change. Let's, let's be clear about that. But we're also challenged by things like paying down debt, you know, that's accumulated across even just the last 18 months. You know, improving productivity, achieving physical, social, cyber resilience, and, and you know, enhancing equality, uh, inclusion and diversity. And, you know, and the list just goes on. It, it's easy for us to construct a long list. And so despite our really best intentions, and, and I think even particularly the desire, the hope that innovation and technology will enable progress, I think the fact is, and it, it's a shocking thing to say, but I think it's provable, that most of these problems persist because much of the time we're actually solving the wrong problems and or at least in the wrong way. And, and really over many years of experience, what I've really come to conclude is that the real challenge is not to make progress tech, technologically possible. I mean, for goodness sake, we put three rovers on Mars in the last you know, six, eight months. I mean, te technically, there's very little we can't do. But I think the challenge is to make progress humanly possible. And it's something I've learned over 30 years of practice, working across multiple industry sectors from Australia to Chile to London. And I've spent really the last decade or more, a bit over the last decade, thinking and investigating why is this happening? You know, why, why is it that we are struggling to really solve problems and make real progress. The thing that I think is exciting is that I think we can reverse this situation. I think we can do it really quite quickly. And when you do it and you see the instances of it happening, the potential, this latent potential that exists in individuals and other organisations is vast and the opportunity to unleash that I think is just both exciting and a real privilege to be part of. And, and, and it really, I think, can lead us towards much more inclusive and sustainable growth. Um, I, I just think, you know, even in, in, our, in our country alone, this untapped potential we have, I don't think we even have an inkling of, of the scale of what that is. So for me, it's this phenomenal untapped potential to achieve great things in our organisations and, and for our communities that really motivates me every day. It's why I wrote the book. I think we often do spend a lot of time thinking about solving the problems, but I love how you shared about that untapped potential. And there's almost this question of what are we missing out on or, you know, what opportunities are there by asking those right questions and solving the right problems? Hmm. I, think I have to ask, did you get a bit stuck yourself in writing this book? And do you have any hacks that, I mean, you know, I'm looking for the short, sharp silver bullet here. Did you have any go-to kind of strategies or tools that you found yourself going to in the process of writing this book? Look, actually, interestingly, I didn't get stuck in writing the book per se, um, but, but I think writing is incredibly clarifying. And it, it reminds me of that, um, the phrase about teaching, that, you know, when, when you teach, you learn a second time. So, you know, I did learn and refine a lot of thinking in the writing process. But, I mean, I think in essence, writing a book is like solving a problem. And, and that problem is, you know, what would be most engaging and helpful for my audience and it was actually before writing that I probably became stuck in thinking about well what is the best way to enable a leader at any level to better understand and apply these insights for, for their personal benefit their organization or their community benefit so you know how do we convey this and um, actually a friend of mine uh, Peter Corey and I were actually even thinking about, well, you know, should, would this be a web-based platform? Is there a technology approach uh, to this? But ultimately I decided that, you know, a book with a very practical focus, but which was really underpinned by the evidence base was perhaps the thing that was going to be likely to be most effective. And in fact, even in publishing it, we decided with the publisher that the wider format of the book, that meant you could lay it open on a table and it could sit on a table for use rather than a read once and put back. So at every stage, and I think just that philosophy of designing to get an outcome, designing to deliver a benefit is why one of the principles I applied through the book, but I think it's one of those principles that should apply into all of our problem solving. Being really clear, what are we really trying to deliver for whom?
That's great. It sounds like it's a real mindset and you've, all, you've used those tools of the book in that writing of the book. And as a fellow engineer, I'm thinking, you know, that problem solving engineering mindset is really coming through. So it's fantastic. Um, now, today, as you mentioned, we're faced with these really big challenges, whether it's global pandemics, climate change, it could even be water shortages in our own back, guard, back gardens, like Stanthorpe recently ran out of water. We've had bushfires. Um, there's big problems for us to solve today. And there's also really small everyday problems as well. So, you know, today we can't just draw a, play, a you know, line on a page and say the road's going from here to here. It's complex. It's complicated. We've got to take a systems approach. We need to uh, do our community consultation, get social license to operate. There's a whole range and myriad of things that we need to do. And of course, it doesn't just extend to things like engineering and roads. Um, all organisations from mining to technology and even tertiary education are faced with employee wellbeing, social licenses to, to operate. And those in the private sector are faced with productivity, sustaining growth and dealing with rising shareholder expectations and experiencing all the comments coming through around stakeholder engagement and the prevalence of that in the discussion as well. So it's critical now more than ever that we're solving the right problem. And Nick, you make a pretty big claim in your book that most people are solving the wrong, wrong problems most of the time. Yeah. That's a significant amount. Uh, I'd like to open it up to the panel. Do you agree with Nick? And what evidence would you have to cite? Helen, we might start with you. I want to um, support what um, Nick's done in the book. I've talked to Nick about it. I think it's a, it is a book to sit on the table. It's not a book to put in the bookshelf. And, and I can see that from my own experiences. Um, I think... Yeah, it's a claim in the book, but I, I absolutely agree that we do waste a lot about solving the wrong problems and not and problem definition, like framing the question is crucial and knowing what what's the outcome you want to achieve, which is very much where you're coming in the first part of the book, and then later you go, you frame the question, you work out the outcome. And then you see it and there's all these techniques that you refer to about designing the solution. And my experience very much in private sector and in government has been a lack of that, that, that time spent of designing the solution. Now, people in the public sector, you know, you sit there and you go, well, particularly in Ken and I, I've been in a lot of places where announcements made, we want it delivered in six months and it's already done to you. And, um, and you're trying to push against that to say, look, even if you've made this announcement and you think this is the problem, give us time to design that solution. And where all I would think that I would say is this the opportunity is, and I know it's difficult to deal with the political environment, if you can demonstrate in more practicality the benefits of that by using this, you can perhaps capture the political masses to say, actually, you do need to spend more time in that front part of that's those solutions. And I've got many examples and some great ones. I mean, one of the best ones where actually I think a lot of people, we thought we were designing a, an outcome for a solution. In fact, it was very clever. We got to the right problem. It was a national competition policy in the 90s. And everybody was all this evidence and work about what the so-called problem was market failure and lack of competitive markets and monopolies. But actually, the reason that was successful is somebody, and it was a Commonwealth State thing, came up with the solution was not, they all knew about this, but how do you get the change? And we then had, the solution was to make it incentivise state governments through money and therefore be able to appease political pressure to not do change, so raise the ante against those that were arguing against it, and that solved the problem. And I always look at that one to say, everyone thinks we were solving for a different problem, but actually, very cleverly, they found the right way to solve that problem. So it's a different way, it's positives and negatives. But Ken, you've got plenty of ideas in this space too, I'm sure. Helen, um, look, I, I completely agree with you about NCP. And Felicity, I, I think um, what, what is important is as well as critiquing where we've got it wrong, to in fact identify, and unfortunately I think it's a small proportion, but we can identify where we've had great successes. 
And so, you know, put a plug for Anzog, we produced a, a book a couple of years ago um, that looked at Australian and New Zealand policy successes. So that we actually said, you know, there, there are things that we've done right. Going back to Helen's point, NCP was, was one of them. You know, there, there was a lot of um, uh, debate about um, the importance. There was a lot of um, concern, you know, about structural changes to the economy. And it was very painful, you know, politically to, to manage those reforms. But, you know, it, it was done. And, and the other, I mean, a, a much simpler example that really struck me when I, I was um, heading premiers in Queensland in the late 90s when we had major problems with drought and we thought it would never rain again and then it rained again and everything flooded and, you know, in Brisbane, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, as, as it normally does in Australia. But the, I, I remember having these grand discussions and from an engineering point of view, um, Nick and Felicity, you'll, you'll appreciate this. We're, we're running out of water, Wyvernhoe's down to 15%. It, it's, if it doesn't rain, what are we going to do? And everyone was saying, well, portable desal will go down to northwest Tasmania and we'll take, you know, big um, ships and, and literally take fresh water and bring up to Brisbane and put it in the distribution system. Then someone came up with this brilliant, you know, issue, which was really what was the problem um, and, and engaged the community, going back to, Nick, your point about engaging the community and people's water consumption voluntarily because people wanted mm. to be part of the solution mm. that they reduce their consumption uh, by two thirds, you know, like, and when it rained again and there was plenty of water, people didn't want to take their consumption yeah. levels back up. But it's a great example of if you get the question right mm. and don't just think about it, you know, like from an engineering or supply perspective about how do you deliver portable desal from the river at Brisbane or these arrangements, but maybe you should engage the community in the solution and people will find a solution. I mean, I think the other big one in Australia is, um, I mean, there are a couple I, I point to across, you know, the political spectrum. Um, when there was uh, agreement on the HIV AIDS strategy in Australia, that was a great example of uh, a bipartisan support for needle exchange when people didn't necessarily politically agree with IV drug use, but there was a bigger problem there, you know, and the bigger problem was how do you stop the transmission of this disease? And we did it best in the world. And the other one, of course, was, you know, Howard's response um, uh, to gun laws after, you know, the tragedy of, of Port Arthur. I mean, that, that was amazing looking at the problem, but we don't do it enough, but we can do it. And I think, Felicity, I'd, I'd be looking at, at examples of where we don't do it well and why we don't do it well, but also look at where we do do it well and what are the, the components that come together to make that actually happen. And particularly, you know, I, I know a lot of comments have been about the political system. Um, Nick mentions in, uh, I've been looking at your slides um, of some of your modules, but we talk about public value and the relationship uh, between purpose, clear purpose, which is really solving the problem, organisational capacity and the authorising mm. environment. More and more, unless you get those three things aligned, you won't get change. Yeah. And so we need political now. So we need to understand the, you know, the politics and getting them on side because we can have all the clarity of purpose in the world. We can have all of the organisational capacity. But unless we get the authorising environment actually engaged, yeah. then, then it's not going to happen. Similarly, if the authorising yeah. environment is engaged but the purpose is not clear. And, and I think, Ken, just to, to pick up on what you and Helen both said is, for me, your examples perfectly underscore that in, both, in all those cases... It wasn't, it wasn't the technical thing that was the difficult thing to do. It wasn't the financial, it wasn't the particular financial policy or the engineering that actually it was both the human capability to think this through as well as then to engage people and find how do we actually make this humanly possible to engage with this and make this work. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one of the things, it's like a crucial aspect of the complexity of problems that gets ignored it's sort of seen as something separate or later, but it's actually a very integral part of the complexity. And in fact, in many cases, it's it's almost most of it. Hmm. And so I think that's the point I make is that actually 
achieving progress is actually about making progress humanly possible. And lots of comments come through the chat on this, particularly uh, around the theme of politics and uh, solving the wrong problems because the right problems are too hard and interplay with politics and announcements. So thanks, Michael, Andrew and Sean for that. We're about to open it up to questions. Before I do, I've got one uh, more question for our panel. I really love how you were talking, Ken, about the benefits. And I think um, as an engineer, that can be a pitfall of my mind that is wanting to go straight to the answer. What am I solving? What am I tackling? And getting straight in without taking that moment of reflection to pause. So by solving problems better, we um, there's a big prize out there. There's a huge benefit that we can gain professionally and personally to business and government of society and society. So what could success look like in practice? How big is this prize? Nick, I might start with you. Yeah, so look, I, I'll, I'll make the claim, and I think, again, it's pretty, it's pretty readily demonstrable. I think the size of the prize here at, for business and, then, and business and government and then in aggregate the Australian community in financial terms alone is billions of dollars a year. And, in fact, I could give you specific examples where, you know, for a major mining company in the space of three days, a colleague of mine effectively helped them work out how to save probably a couple of hundred million dollars and get a better result, a lower risk outcome. But you scale that across the economy and you scale it across time in terms of some of these ways of thinking, they, you don't lose them. Once you start thinking about what is the outcome, you don't lose that mindset. So the... The, the accumulation that we can get here in terms of better practices, the, the, the upside here is vast. And then I think that's financial terms alone. You know, so we, I don't think we have a deficiency of time, effort and money. I think we can actually get better outcomes with less effort. And that's why I sort of so excited about the upside here and the scale of potential is vast. Now, if you think though about, you know, the World Economic Forum is saying amongst many others, you know, the number one skill for the future of work, uh, it's, it's not data analysis, it's complex problem solving. And to be useful and increasingly valued, I think in a world where more complicated problems and analytical problems potentially can be uh, done through AI and other technologies, um, to be both relevant, valued and impactful, this is a really core skill. So I think um, it, it's one of those personally, professionally and particularly for leaders, but at all levels, the ability to apply these skills is personally very valuable um, in terms of actually, you know, I think I sort of look at, you know, you look at the number of hours we work every day, every year, and, and you think about how many days you go home and said, I had an impact today. That was a really great day. I, I think we can get more of those days as well. So I think there's, there are just so many upsides um, that can actually be delivered quite quickly and 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 um, and in a cumulative way. Personal and professional satisfaction. I love that. That's great. Ken, would you agree? Uh, yeah. Look, I think driving productivity and productivity improvements are about getting the improvements. Um, Helen mentioned those improvements in the way our economy runs, but part part of the issue is the complexity of the systems. Um, don't necessarily align that people don't want resolution of the problems. So, for example, with Indigenous inca incarceration in Australia, few people from the right or the left, I think few, very few people, if any, would say they agree with the rate of incarceration at the moment or the cost of that in the criminal justice system. The issue that's evading us is what is the solution? What I'm interested in is, yes, it's a complex problem. It's a very complex problem. And the cost drivers of the criminal justice system are very complex. But this isn't beyond our capacity to solve. It is within our capacity to solve, but it requires people, for example, in that instance, not just to look at a simplistic solution because it's not going to be solved through just one solution alone, but it's going to be solved by looking at the system and what the system creates because prison and incarceration is just the end of the criminal justice system. You need to look at all aspects of that system, how they interact and what the end point is. So I, I think the optimistic issue is these things are solvable. You know, we've solved 
um, uh, very complex issues like, uh, um, you know, not necessarily the equity outcomes, but we've solved a lot of issues about um, infant mortality. We've solved a lot of issues about access to certain services. If we get it right and, and, and point out, and I think part of the political process is the vested interests that don't necessarily want to get a solution to that issue and try and call it out and get it discussed because um, we can't just assume, uh, which is contradictory to where I started, that everyone um, necessarily wants to solve the problem. But, you know, if we do, we can get amazing product, productive results. But part of that will requires us to look at where there may, in fact, um, be losers as well as winners. And, in fact, some of those losers can, you know, in an equity sense, afford to lose some things to get, you know, greater benefit for the community as a whole. So, I, I mean, it just seems to me that, yeah, it, it's, um, it is... It is the, you know, a, a major area of productivity, um, not just what we spend, but what we get for what we spend and how we can get better outcomes um, is, is really fundamental. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a great book uh, called The Magic of Thinking Big, which I've read a number of times. It's a pretty old school book. And he talks in that book about how would you solve the challenge of what if we eliminated prisons? And to begin with, people object. They go, what do you mean? How could we eliminate prisons? But once you start opening up that different conversation, then new ideas flow. And I just love that example because originally when I heard it, I objected too. But then by the end of it, you kind of come up with these all these different ideas. So I think challenging people's thinking is, is really powerful. Um, Helen, what's your perspective? What could success look like in practice from solving the right problems? Well, I think that we've demonstrated when we do do it, how wonderful it is. So we have demonstrations of how important it is and how important it obviously is in the public sector. And I've got some good examples in the private sector. But I think one of the things, Nick, with your book, and we did talk about it earlier and why it's important, and there is a big size of the prize, but I see with the chat room and I observe it myself um, that there's this change in the authorising environment, as you call it, Ken, where... You know, a lot of people say, yeah, you could do all this, but if you don't have the authorising environment and the politics isn't for you, how are you going to solve that? I think the thing about this is if, as you get technically better at it and you do this well, that gains respect. And in gaining respect, you actually do start edging towards getting more of an authorising environment. It's a chicken and egg problem. And so, you know, you do see... I see it. You can see that sort of announced and done and why did they do that? But even in that capacity where there's been, there's recently, I mean, one that I sort of read in the paper is that government's made an enormous investment in mental health. Now, I can see that that is just huge. There's enormous chunks of programs in that and they're sort of saying, well, there's been a Royal Commission as a recommendation. But my gosh, and now we're going to put X amount of money in it. But doing the work through the prism of, well, how do we only get the best outcome for this? Yeah. How do we do this well? Now, you'll get a lot of potential pushback politically, like we want to see X. But the more you do that better, the more you will get more of that engagement you need to actually propel more to a better outcome. And I've seen that done. And that's how you get the confidence that you need. I'm not saying it's not hard. I do know it's really very difficult. But I do believe this type of work and what you're trying to do is actually building that capability to get that confidence. Mm -hmm. and, and we need it, you know. I mean, examples where you can see if we had got the right way of going at NDIS, you know, domestic violence, early childhood development, Royal Commission, the Hain Royal Commission is a classic example where we had a commissioner he identified the problem is there's nothing wrong with the legislation. It's just not being implemented. And boards aren't thinking about the end customer and companies aren't. And you can see, I sit in it in a company where there's been a dramatic change which says we've got to do the right investment in the right way to really change how we think about this issue in terms of a whole range of ways. And so the front structure was right. But how they were focusing on the problem and dealing with it and getting those outcomes, we're just not getting there. So there's just, and that prize is 
billions. And also there's that value proposition is that you do want to do the best for the end customer. Can I just quickly pick up on that too? Because I think, Helen, you've touched on what I think is a really crucial point. And, and I think for me, the front end of the book is really important because I think if, if, if the book's looked at as here's a series of tools and that's useful, well then, okay, that's fine. But what I try to really convey in the front end of the book is um, we have to make progress on these issues now because if we look at the, the diminishing trust in government and the fragmentation in society around these debate of, particularly around complex issues that are hard to grasp, it provides an environment in which we can get really polarised and, and conflicting narratives. And actually just debating them doesn't necessarily get us anywhere. We actually need real progress that people say, hey, hang on a minute, I'm not quite sure how you got that, but I love that. I want more of that. And I think that sense of real genuine progress is important to actually fundamentally, ultimately underpinning a democracy. And, and that's why I think now, as much as anything, this matters so much. You know, the work of the, work of the people within government and government agencies to, to, to achieve real progress. And for, particularly for the private sector, when, you know, the latest trust information from Abelman suggests, look, the private sector is more trusted than government by a significant measure. And, and so the voice and the work of the private sector is equally incredibly important. So I, I think there's this... There's a this sort of tactical issue that, yes, doing better is good for me and it's good for our business, and that's all really valuable. But at the end of the day, there's a much bigger issue at play here, and, and that's one of the fundamental things that's driving me, is saying this work really matters. And, 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 it's, and, it's, and yes, it's challenging, but actually I th think there's another interesting piece here, and that is I think you can get an immediate return on investment. Hmm. And, and, yeah. Nick, I think the, the other issue is, and there's been in the chat, you know, the complexity of interagency relationships. I think to some extent we have a simplistic view that um, there is a unified position within governments or across governments, mm, yeah. and that is patently false. Yes. And, and I remember talking to a colleague who needed to get settlement of a major commercial deal who said... The biggest amount of his time was actually spent getting agreement within one government. Yes. So as to finalise an agreement with you know a major private sector operator, yep. and and you know that is that that's part of the complexity. Yes. Government is complex. It's yep. vague. It, it is uh, you know ambiguous. And then the parts of government are incredibly contestable. Yeah. So I, I, I think, you know, from being within th that, you know, within that system all my life, you need to sort of understand that governments clearly, you know, and in the federation, you know, the way yeah. that federation operates, it, it's not singing with one voice. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and, you know, arguably can only do that in, in some crisis situations. Yes. Great point, Ken, and uh, at least one of the questions that's in the chat from Lola Jones, who says the real problem usually straddles one or two or more policy areas, jurisdictions. Uh, so instead we solve a problem that fits neatly into this imaginary box that we have created. Do the panel agree? And what are your tips for overcoming that? I'd love to know your answers. It's certainly a challenge that I have faced. Who'd like to start with that one? Well, look, I'll start. I mean, I think... Um you know, I think that hits the nail on the head. And, I, and, and therefore, you know, I would ask, so therefore, what is the problem? You know, what is the problem here in making progress? And, you know, I was actually dealing, uh, engaging with uh, some senior executive South Australian government yesterday. And what we talked about is, you know, it's really important that they see their work as a team sport. It's really important at the senior echelons of government to start to get greater cohesion because, but this is both inside government and with the private sector. Almost all of the really significant issues that we need to tackle cannot be resolved by an agency alone or even probably government. We need levels of collaboration. And it's a word that we throw around. We, it, it sounds nice, but we're not good at it. And, and I think what we have to, again, it's a human issue. We actually need to interrogate what we think about collaboration 
and and why this is so hard for us and what assumptions we're making about it. Um, because I suspect, again, these are the real issues. These are the real problems that we need to overcome. Um, and when we do that, again, we can unleash a lot. But we, the, the only other quick comment I would make, though, is um, in systems, uh, you know, there's a lot of things. Helen gave a really good example before. I was trying to think that, that where we always get this cause and effect loop going on that, you know, and, and it's a bit like if we can deliver things from government, we might build more trust that would allow us to deliver more. But conversely, if we don't deliver, we erode trust. And in a lot of complex systems, there are these sort of cause and effect characteristics right at their heart. And there's a lot of noise around that. And I think this is one of the real roles of, of directors, of boards, of senior executives, of heads of government, is to start to see through the noise to what really is going on here. Because then you can do less work, you can be more targeted, and you can have greater impact. And I think this is one of those working in a complex world, that particularly for the senior leaders, this is the work. This is the work. Mm -hmm. I think that, Nick, that's really um, insightful. And I think lots of people want to hear a lot from you. But I would just make a little comment that, and I just saw someone say what is why I hear a lot you know, I'm now sitting in the private sector, how long history in public sector. Collaboration is exhausting. It is no doubt. Mm. And it's not made any easier by being remote. I mean, it's, you know, like mm. there's just no doubt about it. It's a mm. quantum more, but we have to accept that and work our systems and do that well. But there is literally no doubt if you do not do enterprise, what we call enterprise-wide thinking, which is yeah. across large organisations where you've got different parts of your organisation yeah. delivery, if you don't do it enterprise-wide, I can assure you, not only don't you maximise the benefit, you end up with a whole lot of issues yeah. of what we would call compliance and risk issues that are not dealt with. So yeah. it's not just in getting a solution, it's actually minimising and mitigating and understanding that and getting that broader yeah. perspective. And when you're in government, clearly the best things that I ever saw were delivery where you got multiple agencies working together yep. to solve these problems and everyone calls them wicked complex problems because you can't keep them within. They've created mega departments yeah. but still, you know, issues to do with young children to do with mm. health, child mm. protection and education. Yep. You have to move across. Yet you've got these sort of all sorts of things that go on and political situations that make yeah. it difficult. But if you create the capability and slice the problem, and when it worked best is you, are, you, you actually identified clearly the problem we were trying to solve for that multiplicity, what outcome we were going to seek and yeah. what we were all bringing to the table, not try to solve massive but very clear things, you do get that and you yeah. get a huge benefit. And, yeah. and when, when you get collaboration, and typically you get massive collaboration between the government, between governments and the private sector at times of absolute crisis, of yes. natural disasters, etc. It's seamless. It's seamless because people want to get a solution and yeah. they move beyond the vested interests of their own agency. So yeah. they're willing to make decisions outside of the box. Our problem is when it goes back into situation normal, yeah. then we get, I mean, I, look, frankly, we get a bit lazy. And, um, and, you know, you could argue that major reforms have occurred in Australia at times in response to crisis where there had to be collaboration or otherwise we were going to revert um, yeah. into, you know, the Banana Republic, as Keating called it, or, you know, other things at, at times. So it's, it's really interesting how we respond to crises but struggle to take that into our day-to-day -day arrangements. And that's what, Nick, you're trying to do. You're trying to yeah. put a value on that and you're trying to say which is why I like it because, I mean, I agree with you that I always used to ponder, you know, in crisis we can just deliver this massive thing, no bushfires, you know, we had the Black Saturday bushfires, yeah. I was charged that. Unbelievable what we did. Commonwealth State broke every barrier. Why can't you do that normally? Well, there's a whole lot of reasons we know about that. But if you value correctly the problem and, yes. the, and the, that solution, you create, you know, that's what you're losing. You're sort of trying to quantify it. 
Yeah, and I'm really trying to say, you know, so often, uh, and I've seen in so many cases too, that sense of anxiety about the risk of taking action. And, and I think what we're missing in many of those cases is we need to be a bit more explicit about what is the risk here of inaction? What is the cost here of inaction? Let's just get that equation right. But also I think we don't have to leap to one big solution, particularly in the complex, the, the problems that matter, they're inherently complex. Um, Working to a solution, ultimately, we've got a hypothesis. We, th we think this will get us there. But the real work, again, and this is the work for senior leaders, and it's one of those uncomfortable spaces, but it, again, is the real work, is we're learning our way forwards. But if we're very active, and, and again, we apply these types of techniques and ways of working, we can really reduce our risk. We can actually rapidly get better returns. And then that becomes, again, a bit of a flywheel. It's like, well, hang on, actually, we're, we're, this, is, this is building some momentum here. And I think, again, there's that sense of scale that we can get out of that. Um, so it, I think, I really firmly believe this is easier than we think it is. Um, and there's just a few core principles, I think, if we can start to apply them. I suspect, you know, this little wave of change could grow into something pretty remarkable. And, and I, I'd say that the one thing I really would love to have, you know, the question on the lips of every leader is, are we solving the right problem? You know, for me, if that's the only thing we achieved out of this, was that, was that ripple of this question around the nation, are we solving the right problem? Just to get that pause for thought and actually getting people just to inquire a bit more. I think that alone could be quite surprising. Great, you said that. The uh, Nick, the uh, discussion in the chat is a, is agreeing with with that question for sure. Um, it's a simple one, but a challenging one. Has the panel got a, a quick sixty second answer to how do we know we are solving the right problem? Any takers? I think it doesn't answer that particular question, Felicity. But as Nick was speaking, and as I was looking at the at the chat. Part of our problem is we don't share a common language. We, mm. we don't actually um, necessarily agree um, from our different perspectives of how to define a problem because we all come at it from a different perspective. And, and the unfortunate thing is, you know, if you, if you see a nail, you hit it, you know, with your hammer whereas that mightn't be the best way to deal with it. But we've got a lot of our systems react you know, in the way that, that they've historically operated um, rather than step back and, and actually say, well, if we're going to do this, what's a better way of reacting? And governments do, do, the, do the same thing. So there may be better ways and there are better ways of um, uh, progressing with crime prevention, but our approach is fairly stuck in a particular mode of supply. Uh, when you know, technologies change, when societies change, you know, quite massively, governments still talk about uh, numbers of police on the beat. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, that's a, that's a classic example of, you know, not really moving, I think, mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, identifying potentially new ways of doing things. Um, and, you know, the, 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 yeah, the, the language remains the same. It doesn't get back to fundamentals of what, what will deliver, you know, what we'd say public value. Obviously, we always do. Um, we'd say, you know, what fundamentally delivers public value rather than jumping to the conclusion that X delivers, you know, those outcomes. Even to the point of, you know, sacred, you know, areas and, you know, teachers' unions would kill me. But... You know, there, there, you know, like the evidence is not there to suggest that if you reduce class sizes by 0.25, you're going to get any improvement in educational outcomes. So there are, you know, like you, you need to be asking much more fundamental, you know, questions about how do we solve this issue and rather than go to the old patterns of, oh, we'll just throw this at this or, you know, throw, you know, this promise at, at dealing with uh, those issues. Any suggestions, Nick, on how do you know you're solving the right problem? I think it's a fantastic question. And I, I have been thinking about, I think, um, I've made two comments. I, I think one of the reasons why I think we're often solving the wrong problems is because 
we often talk about problems. What we're actually, we say there's a problem. What we're actually saying is there's some symptoms of a situation I don't like. But often we don't actually say what is the real cause of them. So we, we, we talk loosely often about problems. And, and often the default thing we want as an outcome is the absence of the symptoms. It's like, can you just make this go away? Mm. And I think because of that, our, our problem articulation is really clumsy. Now, how do you know when you're solving the right problem? I'm not sure that's what we should be asking. I think the thing what I think the thing we should be saying is, can we come up with a problem statement that we think is inherently better? And I think we do know that. I, and I think you see that when that's articulated that a group of people say, it's just, you just see it in the energy, you see it in the observation. That's a much better, you know, that is to solve that problem is much better work. This is much more worth our time. And I saw a comment too about, you know, often talking about problems can be negative. I think when we also complement that by what's worth working on here, what's the outcome, what's the benefit we want to deliver to people that gets me out of bed in the morning. And I think when we do that, we better understand why something's occurring and what we want to achieve. And hence the problem is closing the gap. That is the work. That's better. Is it right? Let's say it's not right, but surely we're going to get a better return on effort and investment from that better one. And I think that's really, the, you know, in a way it's, can we do that better every day? Can, can yesterday be better than, than today be better than yesterday and tomorrow be better than today? I think that's what we're striving for. Mm. It's great reframing. It's excellent. We rapidly run out of our time. We're almost at the end, which I can't believe. I think I could go for another hour with all the fantastic comments and questions that are coming through. I've got one last question. Helen, I might ask this one of you. It's from Patricia. Uh, it's a provocative question. Uh, uh, how do you obtain authorising um, environment for cross-agency collaboration? How do you determine a governance structure? Or you can answer this last part of the question. How do you sell it to the execs? who like those quick wins. And as a, a millennial, I love the quick wins. And recently I spoke with a, um, a mentor of mine. I was talking about a five-year plan. She goes, no, um, in our board, we don't talk about five-year plans. We're down to three. You need to give me a three-year plan. Uh, so how do you sell it to the execs who like those quick wins, Helen? Well, I, I think we've done it. Plenty. Uh, I think it um, comes a bit to where Nick is. I mean, you find the right problem that you know is, in a cost agency sense, really a nub of something that needs to be solved. And because you're in there and everybody recognises this is an important problem, maybe it's to do with, I'll just give it, you know, like in... Um, early childhood development, you need, you know, some connection to child protection, some connection to education, some connection, whatever. And you find that, or we, when we originally did it, in fact, the first things I ever saw done really well cross collaboration was years and years ago, was on domestic violence well before it was a big issue and police were policing it so badly. And Christine Nixon was, in fact, the head of police. And she brought that problem, but it connected to uh, beyond police, it connected to how they, people were, the judicial system, education, etc. And because everybody was enthused by, by that at that level, and the other thing that we got in terms of the authorising environment, we were able to sell it to ministers to say there is a group of money here that is not owned by one department, but it's going to be held at the core and people need to bid for it in a group ERC matter. So each of them had a, a bid in there and that, in a sense, created the momentum to say we will deliver that and it was very successful at the time. So I think it's being innovative and not trying to initially solve the most largest problem you've ever seen but to break it into smaller pieces but important pieces that everybody can see, my gosh, they did it. That's how they did it. And like Ansel, plan it and explain it and then say, what other things can we do? That's great. I'm definitely going to be yeah. taking that away and applying that in my, my role for sure. 
It's been a fantastic discussion. I'd love to finish off with a key takeaway from each of the panelists. Um, I've certainly enjoyed the conversation of the positives to problem solving, the benefits, and I really heard that there's almost this exponential growth effect when we start solving the right challenges and really having these wins, it, it leads to more and more positive change and positive impact. Helen, what are your final thoughts or key piece of advice for everyone uh, from this session tonight? Well, I have to say my key piece of advice is get the book. <laughs> <laughs> but I do say that generally, Nick, because I think it is. I've seen um, in there um, techniques that I've more recently learned, particularly around designing, framing, implement, embed, and I know they work, and I just think it's thought provocative. So to me, it's my piece of advice is get this book, put, use it, and use it and don't put it on your bookshelf. You know, think about what it's saying, and in each of you in your practical way, pick it up and um, use a piece of it. It's not... You don't have to use every part about it. That's what the great thing about it. The front end is explaining the problems and then the back is different ways to get to solving them. So good work. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Ken, final thoughts, piece of advice? Um, look, I, I, I'm taken with success breeds success because I think often we are, you know, um, glass half empty rather than glass half full and, uh, you know, we, we really do need to look at, you know, as Helen said, you know, how do we solve problems that are solvable and congratulate ourselves when we actually do it and do it well and, um, and then analyse when we, we don't do it, do it so well. Um, in addition to the book, um, we, we'd, uh, I'd, I'd be saying, as you'd, you'd expect, um, those people that want to be involved in more detail, you know, in Nick's work, Obviously, that um, the, the the workshops, Nick, the work that um, we we do not only in problem solving, but I think in proper systems thinking um, and giving people the capacity to to think about systems. And the third issue is, you know, really this engagement. I mean, you can't solve a problem in isolation from engaging people both those supporters, but also those detractors or those that have got different views. And a lot of that, that requires, you know, ongoing negotiation, communication, rather than, um, you know, sort of taking ourselves away and thinking we can solve problems in isolation. Nick, final thoughts? So my final thoughts, first going to start off with a thank you. It's going to thank, thank you, Helen, Ken and Felicity. You know, and to all the ANZOG team for making this possible. Thank you to all the people online. Uh, there's some fantastic questions there that have still got me thinking. I'll be thinking all night about those, so, and I'll follow up with those. Um, so, my look, my final thing is ask better questions because I think at the end of the day, the more insightful we can become about the work we're doing, one of the most powerful tools each of us has to engage others in doing that is to ask great and better questions at all levels of our leadership. Um, and, and, that, and that one on everyone's lips, try it tomorrow, try it in the thing you're working on. Just beg the question, are we solving, really solving the right problem? And see what it does for you. That's great. I'm already thinking about my implementation plan that I'm going to be writing tomorrow in my day job. So it certainly <laughs> helps me. Since I've had the book, I have had it out on my desk at work, not um, on the bookshelf as it is tonight. And it has been one of those things that I flip through and, and grab ideas and just troubleshoot my thinking. So it's a fantastic piece of work, Nick. So congratulations Thank on you. the book. We have had so many, yes, round of applause, so many fantastic <laughs> comments and questions through the chat that we can't answer tonight. But Nick has very generous generously said that he will get to some of those questions. Yeah. So um, if you would like to personally uh, reach out to Nick, we'll pop his contact details on the screen uh, now if we can do that. And um, Nick has very generously said uh, feel free to get in touch with him and um, he will answer those questions. Um, an email will get sent out after this session as well. So we'll pop Nick's details on there um, too. And you heard people say, buy the book. If you want to know where to get the book, it'll be at your favourite in-person or online bookseller. There is the list of distributors there. So I encourage you all to uh, go out and grab your copy. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight, spending your Wednesday evening yeah. with us. And thank you to our panellists. That's everything from us.
Good luck, Nick. Yeah, thanks, Felicity. Thank, Thank you, you, Felicity. She did a great, great job, Felicity. Great job.